Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Gavin Cleesbees. I'm the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society. Uh, and I'm happy to welcome you, uh, whether you're joining us in person uh, or virtually. Um, uh, if you are new to the Mass Historical Society, uh, we are the first historical society in America dating back to 1791. Uh, we are an independent nonprofit organization uh, that maintains a library that provides access to a remarkable collection. Uh, we have almost 14 million manuscript pages, uh, which we make available to researchers. Um, these include the papers of three of the first six U.S. presidents, um, as well as uh, the papers of physicians, politicians, uh, writers and radicals, uh, and everything in between. Um, we host a variety of programs on topics related to Massachusetts and American history, and we hope you'll all join us uh, for future programs uh, moving forward. Uh, this is the final program in a three-program series uh, looking back at the impact of the COVID pandemic in the past two years. Uh, we've spoken to frontline workers from ER physicians to funeral directors uh, and leaders of cultural institutions from the Museum of Fine Arts to the New England Aquarium. Uh, and this evening, we'll speak to some, speak to some of the leading uh, policy advisors. Uh, as we come to the end of this series, uh, it's interesting to think about what's happened in the past two years. Uh, when Boston and the state closed down, I don't think anyone had a real idea of the scale of what was about to happen. Um, since then, over 20,000 uh, residents of Massachusetts have died, uh, and 1.7 million people in Massachusetts, or about one in four people in Massachusetts, uh, have had COVID. Uh, on a larger scale, the U.S. death toll is now over 977,000, uh, and will probably pass 1 million by the summer. Um, uh, I may be wrong about this, I'm not absolutely sure, uh, but I think that this is the highest death toll from any single event in American history. Uh, this is a higher death toll than World War II, the Civil War, the Spanish flu, the AIDS pandemic. Uh, I can't think of anything that's a single event uh, that has a higher death toll than this, which is a, a, a sort of sobering thing to think about. Um, well, I don't think anyone is predicting that COVID is over, I'm hopeful that we have turned a corner, and I think uh, we'll be spending a long time trying to figure out what, what happened in these, these two years. Um, so uh, tonight we have uh, a great program with three people who have been directly involved with managing this crisis. We'll hear from Mary Lou Sutters, uh, the Massachusetts Secretary of Health and Human Services, Dr. Paul Bittinger, uh, the Director of the Center for Disaster Medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital, and Dr. Sandra Bliss Nelson, a physician in the Infectious Disease Division of the Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, so for some brief introductions, uh, Mary Lou Sutter served as a Secretary of Health and Human Services for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, overseeing uh, 12 agencies and mass health with uh, 22,000 public employees uh, de delivering essential services uh, that touched the lives of one in four state residents. Uh, she's served in this capacity since uh, 2015. Uh, prior to joining the Baker administration, uh, she held leadership roles across public and private sectors, including serving uh, as the Massachusetts Commissioner of Mental Health, a nonprofit CEO, and an associate professor and program chair at Boston College School of Social Work. Uh, Dr. Paul Bittinger uh, holds the MGH Endowed Chair in Emergency Preparedness and is the Director for the Center of Disa Disaster Medicine and the Vice Chairman for M Emergency Preparedness in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Mass General. He is also the Director for Emergency Preparedness at Mass General Brigham. He was appointed to the Massachusetts COVID-19 Response Command uh, Advisory Board of Medical Experts and Infect Infectious Disease Specialists uh, almost exactly two years ago. The uh, announcement was March 25th, so almost exactly two years ago. And has been a top advisor to Governor Baker, uh, including being the chair of the COVID-19 vaccine, vaccine advisory group. Uh, he was named the Emergency Medicine Physician of the Year in 2021 by the Massachusetts College of Emergency Physicians. Uh, Dr. Sandra Bliss Nelson is an infectious disease physician at Mass General Hospital and assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. Uh, Dr. Nelson is an Associate Clinical Director of the Division of Infectious Disease. Uh, she <laughs> served as a, a lead doctor on Governor Baker's school uh, reopening panel. So the, the format that we have for the program this evening, each of them is going to give us a, a brief uh, overview of their memories of the last uh, two years. Uh, then we're going to have a moderated conversation, and then we'll take or questions from the audience and from our online audience. Um, so um, 
don't remember. I think we were starting with uh, uh, Secretary Sutters. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. It's a privilege to be with all of you. And thank you for hosting these um, series of conversations. I feel like I'm really anchored with um, uh, specialists here. Um, uh, Dr. Binger uh, uh, took my phone call uh, two years uh, ago to be on the Governor's Medical Advisory Board, and I remember meeting Dr. Nelson really around um, really helping us think through schools and what we need to do our, to keep our children safe uh, and healthy. So um, two plus years ago, the Governor asked uh, uh, that I, in addition to representing 56% of state government, to oversee the Commonwealth's strategic response to COVID. Um, because this was a public health crisis as opposed to a natural disaster, the natural disaster components to it, um, he really wanted health and human services to be the face of the response in Massachusetts. Um, ironically, at the time, uh, first of all, quite frankly, it's been like one long day, as I'm sure it has been for many of us. Um, we thought the command center uh, in my role would be a few months. In fact, when we made the announcement around March 14th that we were setting up a command center structure, it was for, we thought we would be sunsetting it in that June. Um, I've been privileged uh, to work with extraordinary individuals. Um, the two people lying on my left and my right here, um, anyone that we called. So I assembled a group of people both in state government across health and human services, obviously the National Guard, public safety and the like, as well as drew back into public service on a volunteer basis, people who had worked in the public sector and their employers, any phone call I made, um, people were just willing to step up. So it was, um, so in that sense, you really felt the community, even out of a sense of fear and uncertainty, because I think none of us knew what we were experiencing. Um, the, what I would say to all of us is, I continue to be humbled by COVID um, two years later. Um, the positive news uh, despite all of the devastation for people personally, you, you heard the statistics, uh, and everyone has been touched. Whether you had COVID, you know someone who's had COVID, you know someone who's died, you worked in a business that was affected, you have children in school, whatever. Is Honestly, there's no other state I would want to have been in than in Massachusetts. Um, um, obviously, I'm biased. Uh, but one, we have extraordinary public health and medical institutions that operated truly as a system in the earliest days of the pandemic. I mean, competitive outside of a pandemic, of course, um, but truly, we had almost nightly phone calls among hospitals around who had capacity, who could take transfers. It didn't matter whether you were in network, out of network. It, it just, we really felt the hospital and healthcare community operating as one system in Massachusetts. Stretched on occasion over these past two years? Two years? Absolutely. Overwhelmed? No, um, not like some other states. And we used data um, to try to, the data that we had available, that was always changing um, and we acknowledge that, but tried to take the best data we could assemble within our state with all the perspectives. And you know, we're known for our perspectives and opinions in our state, but really tried to take it in in order to put forth to all of you um, the best information we had, the honesty of what we knew uh, and you know, for a while there, I was almost daily press briefings uh, with the governor to really try to convey to all of us in a period of tremendous uncertainty, right? Particularly in those early days um, and, and to pry the information that we needed to work through this pandemic. Um, my punchline to all of us is, and again, we have the experts with us, we're gonna be living with COVID 
Um, we're not gonna end COVID because it's now a virus um, with us, but we have the tools for us to manage COVID going forward rather than COVID managing us. The tools from testing, vaccines, therapeutics, public health data, mitigation strategies um, for us to really work through and managing this. And then my final comment would be, there are enduring aspects of this pandemic. And I refer to it as a twindemic of the physical side of this pandemic and the social isolation and the behavioral health and the emotional health of all of us as we work through this. So that's my, with that I was going to my, my good, I consider Paul a good friend who took the call from me to ask when we were putting together a group of medical advisors um, to be on the governor's medical advisory board so that we could accept, we could just take in the information and, and try to use the science. So, so I, I'll pick it up. I definitely consider Secretary Sutter as a friend, uh, no question. And, you know, it's been an honor to, to try and be of use uh, and, and help support what's, what's certainly been the most challenging response I've ever been part of in my own life. Um, I'm an emergency physician. I still practice uh, clinically, and I've had probably at least three different roles or perspectives uh, in this response. Um, from the beginning, uh, Mass General, where I practice clinically, um, I served uh, in the uh, Deputy Incident Command, the lead role for the hospital. Um, I also, uh, as Gavin mentioned, um, have responsibilities for a 10 hospital system here uh, in the Commonwealth, trying to coordinate and support response across a very different set of hospitals, some on islands where they're very small hospitals with very little resource, some large academic medical centers. Um, and as soon as there's any difference in one hospital doing something from another hospital, I hear about it right away. Um, and, and so trying to harmonize resource utilization policies, uh, risk uh, is, is a perspective. And then obviously, as, as was mentioned, um, really was grateful to try and help uh, the governor's task force, uh, both overall uh, and the secretary advising uh, where I could and, and leading the vaccination efforts. And, you know, there, there's no way, obviously, in a very short period of time to summarize uh, so much of what we've been through. But um, I, I would say the phases uh, of this um, pandemic really stick out to me some uh, most. Um, it, uh, it has felt like a long day. It does. I, I, I blink and it, it feels like it was just barely starting to be 2020. It's, it's interesting that in, in January of 2020, I was actually traveling internationally with a few folks um, who are very prominent in the um, global infectious disease world. And we were in Israel just learning of what was happening in, in China. Uh, and um, we mused among one another, could this be the pandemic uh, that we're that we're expecting? Uh, you know, we did many, many of us mused in 2009 when we had the latest influenza pandemic. Could this be the next big pandemic? And I don't want to minimize uh, what happened then. There were lives lost. It had certain populations really affected, but it didn't pan out the way we expected with overwhelming ICUs and ventilators. Um, and between those musings in January, what we started to see in, in March, it, it became what we were afraid of. Um, and um, I've never seen the hospital transform um, the way that it did, the medical system come together the way that it did. You know, again, Mass General Hospital, my hospital, hospital has 60,000 visitors every given day, or did before the pandemic, in a weekend overnight, shut its doors and started screening every single individual coming, started issuing every individual coming to the hospital a mask because that seemed like the right thing to do. And to, and to make that sort of extraordinary change, which in any other world would have taken three to six months worth of meetings and engagement <laughs> happened overnight. Um, and, and that happened again and again and again. Well, I'm sure we'll talk about this in a little bit, but you know, my hospital, which has the largest number of ICU beds in New England uh, at about 150, um, in, in those 150 ICU beds, about 50 of those patients are intubated on a given day. Uh, and that's normally, um, had 180 intubated patients in the first uh, wave. Um, we created ICUs in many, many parts of the hospital that were not ICUs. And again, opening a new ICU almost every day or two, um, a pace of change that was just extraordinary in the health system. 
then for my system, um, trying to, um, again, find the, the best way to use the limited resources. It, it, you know, we quickly forget how scarce N95s were. Mm -hmm. Surgical gowns, just the, just the protective gowns that we needed, um, you could not buy. Um, a surgical gown that cost us 80 cents cost $8, and we used tens of thousands of them in a week. Um, but you couldn't find them. We didn't matter what, what the cost was, we, did, we, could, we could buy them. Trying to find ways to get what we needed and then reassure our caregivers that they could provide safe care, that they needed to come to work, that, that they could be safe at work. Um, those challenges were extraordinary. And then working with our patients in the public and, and working with, with the governor's office to tell people what, what they needed to know. Um, and um, Dr. Nelson, I'm sure I'll talk so much about this, but throughout this pandemic, the Secretary Sutter said it very well, it's kept us humble. Everything we thought we knew, we changed. Um, the dogma in public health for a long time had been that masking in public really didn't make a difference, that it didn't help. Um, and therefore, um, that's what we thought we knew until it became clear that we needed to change. Um, and, and being able to communicate why we're changing, why we think it's helpful, uh, when we have hints at data, but not yet data, um, and, and from a policy perspective, knowing when you know enough to make a change before you're certain and it's too late and you miss the opportunity. Um, there, there's a, a famous quip, um, in medicine and, and much of science, um, that the plural of anecdote is data. Um, and uh, trying to know when it really is data versus when it's a bunch of stories uh, was one of the hardest things to, to, to do. Um, and there were some um, missteps where uh, certain, especially in the scientific world, um, preprint data would be published as a, a hint of something that would be useful for patient care or a better way to take care of patients. And it, you know, weeks or months later would be disproved uh, in terms of when to intubate patients, when to put them on ventilators, what settings to use, some of the medicines, hydroxychloroquine. Um, but, um, but trying to use the best data you had, make decisions when you felt like you knew enough was, was the most extraordinary change. To wrap up quickly, I talked about the beginning phase a lot. I think that second surge phase, um, when we knew we were going to face another surge, we had to get ready and do it all over again with a much more tired workforce than we had the first go round. But then also trying to manage vaccination of the workforce and of the public um, in the best possible way was certainly a challenge. And then um, this latest um, wave, we've had three large waves, uh, if, you, if you count the peaks in Massachusetts, Yet another wave with a yet a more tired workforce than it ever has been before. Has been before a smaller workforce um, and less unanimity in I think both the healthcare community and the public about what's the right thing to do and, and how well we work together. Um, you know, the, in, in March of 2020, people were clapping for healthcare workers when they went home from the hospital, and that certainly isn't happening now. And trying to figure out. Um, how we will stay together, how we will work together in each of the, in this constantly changing environment has been a struggle, but we'll, we'll talk more and I'll turn over to, you know, I, I will say, uh, the Secretary Sanders was so kind to, to talk about how I may or may not have been helpful to, to her and to, to the administration, but I, I will tell you that I had many, many times I called Dr. Nelson uh, <laughs> for her advice. She's just been an extraordinary voice of wisdom. And, um, and when we talk about trying to figure out what's really data versus what's a suspicion or anecdote, I called Sandy and I'm very grateful that she's here with us as well. Well, thank you um, to both of you and, and thank you to the Massachusetts Historical Society for having us and having this panel. Um, I think all of us have been aware really from the beginning that we were living in a new part of history and history was being written as we were acting. And that was, I think, um, you know, added, added significance to what we were doing um, from the very, very beginning. Just to sort of preface my comments, you've heard that I'm an infectious disease physician. Most people before the pandemic didn't really know what that was, had never really heard of anybody. Um, you know, now Tony Fauci is a household name and everybody knows what an infectious disease physician was. But we were pretty happy to sort of operate under the radar without a lot of fanfare. Um, taking care of patients. And before the pandemic, 
My area of academic expertise was in musculo, is in musculoskeletal infections. I take care of patients with bone and joint infections, orthopedic device infections, and I'm really an academician. I do research, I take care of patients, I educate. Um, and I think if it hadn't been for this pesky little virus, I would have just gone down that path. Um, Paul mentioned a lot about the first wave, and I, I know we're really not here to talk about sort of the frontline response, but I will just echo how unbelievably remarkable that time was and how rapidly our systems had to evolve and adapt. And for those that were living it on the front lines, it was amazingly stressful. And we were not only taking care of patients who were severely ill, just the, the amount of the severity of illness was in, in many ways unprecedented. The word unprecedented, we wanted to retire at the end of the first wave because every day there was something that was just True. new. Um, the, the volume of patients, the lack of knowledge, we really didn't know what we were doing. We, we tried our best, but we had very little data. And then as was mentioned, the fear that, that perhaps we would be taking this on ourselves, bringing this virus home to our family. So after that first wave uh, passed and we were beginning to decommission some of our surge structures and we were able to take a little bit of a breath, um, it then became clear that, that the rest of society, which wanted to reopen, needed help interpreting the vast amount of data to try to inform safe strategies. And at that time, my, my then boss, uh, Rochelle Walensky, who is now the head of the CDC, asked if I would lead our uh, COVID ex sort of external advisory group. And, and so I became a COVID advisor. Since then, I have advised a number of different organizations, including corporations, schools, school districts, religious organizations, professional sports leagues, professional sports teams. Uh, uh, I'm sure there are others that I can come up with, but, but many different ones. And I would never have envisioned that would have been my day job uh, much earlier. Um, in terms of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, I've taken several roles, but the one that's been the most, I think, meaningful to me um, and the most impactful in many ways has been around schools. Uh, I began advising the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education in about May of 2020, so just after that first wave had ended. And as I understood the role, it really was to help interpret the science as the science was evolving particularly around what we understood about COVID in children, the severity of infection, the uh, transmissibility, uh, and the, that to inform what we understood about safe school reopening. There wasn't a lot of data at the time. There was a lot that we thought we knew. In retrospect, I think there were some caveats to that data that we didn't fully appreciate, uh, particularly uh, on limited testing and, and really a lack of understanding of the full breadth of infection that we were seeing amongst children. But nonetheless, as we were interpreting that information, I became really quite aware that not only did we have to interpret the risks of COVID to the community, but we also had to take into consideration the harms associated with the mitigation that we were putting into place. And we couldn't really advise around risks without the context. It cannot be done in a vacuum. And I think that's one of the reasons that advising around COVID became so controversial. Um, one of the anecdotes, anecdotes that I wanted to share was uh, really the first time that I met Secretary Sutters, which was at the State House um, in June when we, we rolled out or the Commonwealth rolled out its plans to reopen schools in the fall of 2020. And I believe strongly at that time, and I still do, that uh, there were tremendous harms associated with school closures and that those harms were at least as significant to the students of Massachusetts as the risks to, of COVID at that time. And that there were safe mitigation strategies that were available that would allow us to get our kids back into school safely. Um, we stood up and we talked about how to do that. And one of the most controversial elements was the distancing recommendation between three and six feet. And the CDC had come down on six feet. And, and if you just do the math, there was no way we could get our students back to school if we had to maintain six feet of separation. 
But as an infectious disease expert, I knew that there wasn't a wall at six feet, that, there, that, that transmission can occur at shorter distances and at six feet or beyond, there's no guarantee either. And that with mitigation strategies in place, there was a path forward that would allow us to get kids into school. And so I stood up along with the secretary and the governor and said, I think it's, it, we can do this, we should aim for six feet, but if we can't achieve that, three feet is okay. I was not quite prepared for the backlash. Um, as an infectious disease physician, I'm sort of used to being liked. Um, and I, have, I, I really think it was the, my own indoctrination into the world of politics. And there were many people who came down hard on that, on that um, interpretation or that rationalization of, of getting our kids back into school from my own colleagues who didn't think we should be uh, disagreeing with the Centers for Disease Control, the media, um, naysayers on social media who seem to think that we were trying to put nails into coffins. Um, and, and I think I really had to do some soul searching at that time about how I could move forward to continue to do the work that we needed to do despite the pandemic. There are certain truths that we couldn't take away and how can we move forward? Um, I will say there have been many joys in this as well, um, meeting people across a spectrum of different worlds that I would never have had an opportunity to meet. Seeing our students go back to school, putting their backpacks on that first day of school was tremendously validating. Seeing students back on college campuses, seeing the pews fill up at our local churches, all of these things have, have given me value and I think some sense of motivation and purpose in moving forward. So I'll stop. Well, thank you all, and thank you very much for all of your service. Um, so we have a couple of questions that we circulated before, and I don't think we'll get to all of them, so I'll just cherry pick from a few. Uh, but following up a little bit about uh, what Dr. Nelson said, um, you all have uh, very prominent positions, but not necessarily positions that are usually on the front page of the Boston Globe. Um, when the pandemic started, you all found yourselves in spotlight, in a spotlight that was probably pretty uncomfortable. <laughs> Uh, can you talk a little bit about what that was like for all of you? Uh, Secretary Sutters, you probably are, have the most experience being in the spotlight, but maybe not uh, quite to the degree that you did. <laughs> um, it, um, so um, prior to the pandemic, as secretary, I certainly engaged in you know a, a lot of public speaking, uh, a lot of visiting programs and and uh, the like, uh, and certainly I'm not uncomfortable being in front of the press at the occasional press conference on a topic that I had some level of control over the subject matter. Uh, it was completely, it completely changed. Um, I have, uh, I am no, as a public official, um, but I was not a, you know, out in public, public official. Within my community of health and human services, I, I, was, I think I was fairly well known as secretary. But to find myself in almost daily press briefings, um, I realized everything had shut down because I was part of the reason everything got shut down. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm like, I was working 18, 19 hours a day. Um, the good news is your tax dollars were at work. But to then be in front of the television cameras every day, trying to convey a sense of purpose, calm, the data we had, being comfortable with providing direction with incomplete data, I'm becoming very comfortable with the best data I had. I remember literally walking from the command center was physically located on Washington Street in Boston and walking up the hill to the state house when the city was completely empty. If you remember, it was a ghost town and we'd be walking up to the state house. My cell phones, I have two of them, would be going off with literally like the latest information and literally in real time writing what the last piece of information I had before I was about to be like literally walk in front of the cameras with the governor. Um, I am now a public figure um, with the, um, so I have no privacy and I don't say that with anybody, 
I, I walk into a store um, and someone will come up to me and say, um, are you? <laughs> you know, it's, just, it's just the way they lean in. Like, like you almost would say, no. Um, <laughs> no, no, but, but uh, and most of it is very kind um, at this point. Uh, uh, for five months, I had state trooper protection um, just because of the, um, just the, the uncertainty and fear that existed in the public that um, translated into, um, for some people, hostility and uncivility. Um, uh, that was just personally, you know, uh, I'm used to being a public, a public person to having to defend yourself in his public dollars. That that was just personally difficult for a period of time. Um, I, what I can honestly, I, I can say in front of all of you that I have stood on the shoulders of many, many people um, trying to channel the best information we had at the time when we made mistakes to be transparent about it and acknowledge it because uh, there was no playbook. Uh, but it has been, um, uh, and I'll just end on this funny. So I, I did finally have a, um, a respite uh, in two years. So I, my spouse, my husband and I uh, went away on a plane um, and um, sitting next to me, this woman, a very kind woman says to me, I didn't want to come up to you in the in the airport to say anything. She says, I'm, I'm thrilled that I'm sitting next to you. So for two and a half hours, we talked about COVID. <laughs> 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 and, and she kept saying, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, so I have come to appreciate that I am um, a, a public figure in that, in that sense. And the other thing I would say is I came to also realize but a question that the governor was asked by the press that he didn't want to answer, he would say, and my secretary. <laughs> <laughs> so you just have to, um, you just, um, you do the best mm -hmm. that you can. Um, but it, it is it is a little disconcerting when you're a public servant in the service of the public, that all of a sudden you find yourself to be a, a, a very public figure. And I'm not sure I had quite appreciated that. And that, all, that comes with that. No, no I, I mean, I'll pick up on, on that and a little bit of, of what Sandy was saying. I think um, simultaneously, probably one of the better, but also clearly the hardest experiences of my lives was around vaccination. Um, the vaccine work group uh, that the command center and the owner put together was just- and after the chair. And, and, <laughs> yes, and, and that I still feel privileged to have been able to chair was absolutely extraordinary. Uh, a number of people who care so deeply about equity, about fairness, about making a real difference, about data. Um, we, we, we went back and forth about how to figure out um, how to prioritize prisoners is one example, uh, when almost no state in Massachusetts was giving vaccine to prisoners uh, when it was uh, scarce, yet they were clearly a high-risk population with no recourse no ability to control their own health or, or, or day, uh, destiny. Um, and those discussions were so thoughtful and so um, impressive. Uh, one member, it, it's a little bit uh, hearkening to what Secretary Sutter said, one of the members of the discussion group said, this has been the best experience of my life and I'm so glad I live in Massachusetts uh, for, for that exact reason. Um, and I, I still feel so proud of how we tried to approach the prioritization of underserved communities, the communities that were hardest hit clearly had borne a disproportionate burden uh, in uh, COVID illness, trying to get vaccine there uh, in, into those groups and, and kind of coming up with several very innovative strategies. On the flip side, there just wasn't enough vaccine at the beginning, right? And, and there were lots of issues of getting the vaccine to the communities that were hardest hit, no question. But, but, but the, again, the vitriol uh, and, and the letters sent to my office, the, the messages left on my phone, the, the social media, just in, in every way. Uh, and, and, you know, I certainly never have intended to be a public figure in any way, uh, but, uh, but just, you know, because of, of sort of the role I played really being directed at me. And, and it's just, it's very hard to, to um, 
to reconcile when, when you know there are a lot of people that don't think you're a good person when you've tried really, really hard to do the, the best thing that you can. Um, and that also has gotten better. And, and, you know, really all of it changed with the supply change of the vaccine. Um, but um, there, there are definitely moments where you have to remind yourself um, why you're trying to do what you're trying to do and, and, and um, that, the, the, that you're, you're proud of the product you, you had with the, the prioritization. So um, it's, it's, good. it's good for going forward. It, it's certainly, um, I think, a reminder for everyone. And I think public service, not, again, I'm not in public service the way the secretary uh, is and so many other people are, but it's a reminder that it's an opportunity that you do a tremendous amount of good, but you have to stay grounded in why you're doing it. What's, what's the outcome? Because um, there will be some extraordinary setbacks, at least there certainly were for me. Our schools were uh, minorly controversial. <laughs> schools were, were very clearly um, controversial. And I think early on, I did spend a fair bit of time in various media um, channels trying to really promote the idea of how we can get our kids back to school safely. In so doing, uh, it's interesting how, again, uh, there was an, a, a political alignment. And so I remember one media channel, every time I would be on, they would say, well, you are part, you, you work with the governor on this. And it was, you know, it, it, it removed me as an independent expert and aligned me in, in a particular camp. And I ultimately felt that I could provide better service to the Commonwealth if I became somewhat less public and became reverted to my, uh, my ability to do what I do, which is review the data and try to provide the best advice that I can and not try to make it about me as much as about the experience. I will say one of the um, interesting media stories that I have early on when we were putting, we were really trying to um, promote the idea of, of getting kids back to school, uh, some month in maybe July or August, uh, then President Trump announced that he wanted all American students to go back to school. And I remember thinking, oh, this is going to make our job a little bit harder in the state of Massachusetts. <laughs> and at the time, it was somewhat comical, but, but actually, that was the reality. And shortly after that announcement, um, my press office began getting requests from Fox News channels across the country um, trying to get me on to promote return to school. And, um, you know, again, you mentioned being grounded. And when these types of requests came in, I really said, how does this help me advance my, my beliefs, my goals, my values? And if the answer is that it doesn't, then I said no. And that's been a pretty good, following my moral compass has been a pretty good tool um, as I've tried to work with, with um, the media. Uh, well, sort of following up on that, um, this public health emergency has been political pretty much from the start, which is kind of shocking. Uh, this took lots of forms, um, and early on, there were issues about the distributions of PPE, there were questions about where masks were made, uh, there was the Patriot plane, we'll remember that, it seems like a flash from the past. Uh, <laughs> later, it evolved into questions about school closure and mask mandates and then vaccine resistance. Um, can you talk about what it was like trying to, to learn and apply science uh, in the midst of all this political turmoil? I mean, just the national sort of tone just went very negative very quickly. Uh, and I'll sort of throw it open to whoever like to step in first. <laughs> you want to continue? I think that's, a, that's um, certainly a, a challenging question. Uh, you know, the science very early on there wasn't so much of it that we couldn't begin to keep up with the science, but it was so limited and so contextual. And what we understood around transmission, for example, was, was from a society, China, that was functionally very different from our own. And, uh, and then when the virus sort of came to our shores, it behaved in a different way, which very likely was a a reflection of our behavior uh, more than the virus itself. Early on, there was um, 
a, a lot of focus on on some of these small studies. We talked to, you talked about the preprints. Um, you know, people people talk about. I'm just kind of waiting for that preprint to come out. You know, you no longer wait for the real article. You just you just read the preprint, and then months later, you just ignore the study. It's too old by then. Um, and it did show some vulnerability because we were making judgments on studies that really hadn't been validated or peer reviewed. Um, and I think we became better over those first few months in understanding what the limitations were. Initially, we took a lot at face value and over time we said, wait a second, this study actually didn't take this into consideration and it, and it gave us a little bit of a better understanding about what we didn't know. And, um, and I think as was said by Secretary Sutters, we really had to um, make judgments with imperfect science. Um, I remember one of the one of the um, one of the things that I struggled with was that the public servants would would indicate, you know, we're following the science. And behind the scenes, I knew that the science actually wasn't sufficient to provide recommendations. And you know, really, interpretation of science is around judgment. And that's where the policy decisions are being made. They're being made using judgment around limitations of data. And, and that's not new with this pandemic. It's just been much more public than, than decisions that have been made in the past. And um, um, what we tried to do within the Commonwealth was, so we brought together a medical advisory board. Um, which included um, Rochelle Walensky and Dr. Bittinger and others, um, Rochelle now being the head of the CDC, of course, really to um, bring whatever data and science they had in a way that was um, a private conversation um, with the governor. So these were these were meetings, obviously all happened virtually, um, but were very robust um, the data people had so outside of the public domain so that we could just debate what else did we need to know, not know, uh, and the like brought together as Paul said, a vaccine and, and advisory group, um, uh, you know, with three co-equal principles, right? Saving lives, protecting our healthcare system and, and addressing equity, those very robust, the reopening, Anyway, of having really different perspectives, different voices with different understandings of coming together. The, um, the governor spent a fair amount of time, I mean, quite honestly, in the early days, we came quickly to realize that states were on their own. Um, that was like one of those lonely moments when um, I lost uh, half a million uh, N95 masks at the port of New Jersey under a federal program called Force Majeure, Majeure where literally we had, we, had, we had it, we paid for it, it was coming to Massachusetts and literally it's like a computer screen goes blank. Like the product has just disappeared. Um, and it, it was truly one of those moments where you just, and that's when we just um, really went out of the box. I mean, I think, so that, out of the box is not science. Maybe me be the first one to say that. Uh, but that is when, like, we reached out, realizing I know now so much more about supply chain on PPEs and and um, uh, gloves and pipettes and pipettes and all these things. But I mean, that's where the craft plane came in. Was we secured all this product from China, couldn't get commercial planes, and Honestly, just you, you, you know, you did what you, you needed to do. To, to keep Massachusetts um, residents safe. Um, and I never realized that PPE was a four letter word. <laughs> <laughs> um, we try to keep some humor, as you can tell from this, but when you realize you're just, um, but we always have tried to use data and the science we had um, and then listen to the, the anecdotes, the narratives and people's pain to really I mean, that's really been our true north here, so, as incomplete and as imperfect, which were the first ones to acknowledge it's been. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I completely agree. And I think, you know, 
these conversations that we've had have been definitely robust. Uh, and, and it, you know, it, it, it involves several things. It's, it's obviously what do we know and what do we not, not know and how confident are we, in, are we in what we know. But, but it's also no individual decision is, is ever made in isolation, right? And the more we change, the worse it gets. Uh, and, and I mean that for two reasons. Um, one, it's a huge amount of work. Any change is just a ton of work, whether it's masking on the subways or in the hospitals or any, you've got to print new signs, you've got to set up new system. It just, every change cascading across a, a state of 6 million people and, you know, 70 hospitals or you name it, it it's just an enormous amount of work. And, and in this pandemic, every little bit of work mattered. Um, and so you have to recognize that. But, but more importantly, I think every change you make makes people wonder, why did you change? What didn't you know? What did you get wrong before? Um, and you actually lower people's confidence in the system the more you change. And you're trying to change to adapt to data, to adapt to what we're learning, to, to keep up with, with this un, unprecedented, the, the, the taboo word, unprecedented pace of, of generation of knowledge. And whether it's in the medical or the public health sphere, there's no question that we have churned out data faster than we ever have before in public health or medical history. But you can't possibly change policy every single time a new paper comes out. Uh, the public clearly is tired of it. And, and, and the, again, they, they, they believe you a little less. Well, you know this now, but you didn't know it last week. You must not be very good at what you do. Um, and, and so it's trying to find that balance of, of when you have to really acknowledge this is important data. And there will be meaningful progress if we make a change. And I think that's just constantly the, the discussion is when's the right time and when is it worth the risk of changing how people feel about the guidance you gave previously and, and the effort that's going to have to go into to, to updating. Well, uh, I know that we have probably some questions from the audience and some questions from our, our uh, audience online. Uh, so I just have one last question, which is, you know, there's a lot of discord in the world right now. There's a lot of political discord. There's a lot of just problems. Like it's hard. I mean, I just had this conversation with some people who are in the history community. It's hard to find workers. Like nobody can hire anyone. Like everything just seems a little off kilter. People can't find paper. <laughs> you know, it's like who knew that was going to be a problem? Uh, but we also seem like we've turned the corner. And so, as people who know more about what happened behind the scenes than, than the rest of us. Um, do you feel hopeful about moving forward? Does this seem like we're in a good time? I, I feel more hopeful than I have in a long time. Uh, I really do. Um, you know, unfortunately, we likely are going to see, at least in the short term, some rising case numbers from the BA2 variant, the new variant, um, because it's more transmissible than Omicron, which was more transmissible than any previous version and most any of the respiratory viruses we know of. Um, that being said, uh, back to being so grateful for living in Massachusetts, we are uh, in, in one of the best places for not just vaccination, but boosters in, in the country uh, and, and still general adherence to public health recommendations. Um, so I think that puts us in really good stead. We also, of course, continue to have a really robust healthcare system. But we also have more and more tools. So... Um, when people have symptoms, they should get tested. Um, if they are in any way high risk and they are tested positive, we now have either infusions or pills we can give them that can decrease their chance of being hospitalized by 80%. Um, and that's on top of the benefit of already being vaccinated and boosted. And so, you know, the pivot from this terrible pandemic that's taken such a toll on everyone's health and, and cost so many lives um, is, is if we can limit your chance of being hospitalized or dying, we can't eliminate it. That's not the reality for medicine. But if we can get it much, much closer to the baseline viral illnesses, the others that we have through a really efficient testing, treating surveillance system, we can actually manage the impact on society. We can get closer to normal. We can head towards endemic. And that, that's, that's a lot of what gives me hope. Um, I am hopeful. Um, I'm a worrier, but so that was part of my job. But I am hopeful because of the tools that we have that we have did not have two years ago. Um, there is um, we'll be rolling out to everyone in the Commonwealth sort of like a be prepared kind of a right right 
get vaccinated. Right? If you're not vaccinated, get vaccinated. If you're not boosted, get boosted. Right? If you don't feel well, get a test. If you don't feel well, stay home. Um, right? If you're if you're uncomfortable or you're worried, wear a face covering. So we're going to be, so how, how do we manage COVID, right, rather than COVID managing us? So in that way, in that sense, I do have hope. Um, I can say that shutting everything down is, well, it's hard on all of us. It was easy. Reopening things is, is harder, right? So moving, moving from a pandemic to an endemic, because of, um, it's just harder, right? It's not, you won't, there won't be a bright line. Um, but we are we are in a we are in a better place. Um, it's extraordinary to think about how these vaccines, safe and effective vaccines against being seriously ill and dying, have come to the market so quickly. And that is really a testament of um, the best minds in science and medicine coming together. Uh, and we will and therapeutics will continue to evolve. So I, I do. I do have hope, but we will, and we will start to talk about, we're gonna see, we're gonna see times of rising cases and positivity rates increasing. Um, but what we wanna see, really see is we don't wanna see hospitalizations, deaths. And so we will talk about this differently over time um, as we, hopefully this at some point will just become an annoying, highly transmissible virus that we have good vaccines and boosters for that we'll see some seasonality for. So yes, I do think two years, I'm, I have hope. You know, I think likewise, I, I consider myself an optimist and I think even in at the darkest days early on, I, you know, I think there was always reason for hope. Um, you know, in addition, you mentioned we have so many tools in our toolkit that we didn't have before. Vaccines, testing, therapeutics, we, we also have the advantage of two years of lessons learned. And so when I think back just to my own psychology early on and how enormously challenging that was, we are in such a different place. And you know, even with the second surge, there was a comfort that, okay, we've been through this before, you know, we can do this again. Part of it, I think also is our mindset is different than it was then. There was a lot more fear and I think there's a lot more willingness to accept some degree of uncertainty and risk than there was in, at, at the beginning. Um, I also wanna think, although I am hopeful and optimistic, um, I do also think we need to anticipate the surges that may come in the future. And what I really wanted to get around is that, that if we do have to return to some of those earlier pandemic measures, um, it's not a failure. This is just where we need to go and we just need to be prepared for that. And, and we, we kind of, we've got this, you know, I think when these things happen, you know, I feel we're, we're much better off than we were. We can manage this. I, we know what we need to do um, to keep moving forward. Okay, thank you. So um, as I was listening, I'm taking, I've been taking notes, uh, <laughs> but so I understand um, that, you know, what you said, like the more often, the more often you change policies, the less confidence people have, I'd say, in the healthcare system. What, I mean, if, I'm, I would assume that there are some permanent policies that have been enacted since the pandemic. I was wondering if you could shed some light on those for us. Yes, well, it's maybe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, you know, it's the permanent that I don't know. I think, um, what um, what will we probably be doing for the foreseeable future? We will have much easier access to testing uh, than we ever have uh, had. And we will be actively screening patients in high risk situations. Again, I think for the foreseeable future, trying to identify who has COVID so that we can do better infection control. Um, I think we will likely be using masks uh, for the foreseeable future in the healthcare setting as well. Um, and, and now we have data we didn't have at the beginning of the pandemic on their infect, effect on uh, infection control. Um, I, I think we, we are um, actually um, changing the culture of don't come to work when you're sick, uh, right? Especially in medicine, it was a good tough thing when you were a physician uh, to come to work sick, you were brave and you were fighting for your patients. And, 
The reality was, unfortunately, even then we were putting our patients at risk, but no one acknowledged it. Now I think we know that's not the right answer. And so there will be some good lasting benefits from that. I, I you know, you're, you're all aware we've had, you know, less flu than we've ever had before. We've had certain other illnesses have been down. I'd like to see that, that beyond just COVID, we will make some sustainable benefits in infection control in the healthcare setting. So another one that's lasting is um, Massachusetts was probably the innovator of telehealth. Yeah. We were a slow adopter of telehealth and telebehavioral health. Um, we did it through an executive order. Uh, one day, basically didn't have much of it in Massachusetts. The next day, we did a, an executive order uh, and uh, reimbursed um, in-person the same, or uh, um, telehealth the same as in-person. Um, the legislature actually adopted, particularly for behavioral health, um, in perpetuity now. And I, so I think telehealth was one of those, um, we all talked about it and believed in it, and but it was just, uh, didn't really catch on a lot. And I think it's now very much part of our ecosystems uh, and certainly on the behavioral health side for a number of people really was a lifeline when everything else was shut down. So that's a that's one of the policies that I think, in addition to the ones that Paul said, that um, there was some um, good. There's also some practice changes. Um, I think that maybe it's a little too wonky, um, but that um, allowing like physician assistants to act, to act a more independently and the like. Uh, but I but I do think one of the culture changes as a social worker, we did the same thing. Didn't matter how, I remember once I went to work with pneumonia many years ago because I was just going to tough it out. Um, and, you know, we really, when you're not well, you need to stay home. <laughs> we, we, we created a new word for that as well. We call it presenteeism, yes. which is the opposite of absenteeism. You know, it's, it's a problem when you are present when you shouldn't be. <laughs> and so the, the new, uh, the language around that is presenteeism. I think the only other um, one that comes to mind, the other change, which isn't so much a policy as a recognition, is the importance of ventilation. And I think what we've seen over the last couple of years, uh, this would be an example of something that um, I humbly admitted my errors early on. I, I undervalued ventilation, uh, as I think many of us did. Um, as data evolved and we clearly came to understand that ventilation was in fact more important and putting the resources towards improving the health of the buildings that we spend time in, I think will carry lasting benefits uh, going forward. Clock is two minutes fast. <laughs> <laughs> we'll wait for the clock. Well, I'll throw out two questions that you can answer either or both or neither. Uh, one is um, long COVID. Because it seems it's getting a lot less attention than I think it ought to. And number two is the importance of communication. Because at least for me personally, I would rate the CDC, I've lost all faith. I would consider them a D minus yeah. being charitable. I'll take the communication one, but I'm leaving long <laughs> um, I I think. Um, we share some of the frustration around um, communication. Um, it is, we have tried very hard in Massachusetts to communicate, communicate um, plainly, simply, consistently. And then when there's a change to say, we are changing for this reason. Um, uh, I was on a call with the White House on Friday and one of um, the pleas among states is if there's going to be a change, even if you can't tell me what the change is, could you at least tell us that in the next week expect um, and then you know you receive a press um, press release. Um, I do think together one of the lessons is around clean, simple, constant communication and just to reinforce something that Paul said, um, we spend a lot of time about when we are going to make a change in policy because of just the ripple effects to make sure it's then out, everyone understands it, um, all, the, all the websites are changed, right, so that you don't go onto a website and say, well, wait a minute, it doesn't say six feet, that's three feet, and just the clarity of communication. I, I do think that is something that together in the public health community, we need, we need to, uh, we would agree with you, we need to improve upon, sir. Yeah.
Um, you know, I, I'm happy to take the long COVID question. Um, you know, this is something that became known to us early in the pandemic that there were individuals who had persistent symptoms for some period of time. And it seemed to be worse in individuals who had severe disease, but present in individuals who had uh, lesser degrees of, of illness. One of the great challenges is there was no definition for long COVID for many, many months and, and really into the second year of the pandemic. There actually is a lot of research right now uh, going on. And so even though it may not be on, on the, front, um, of the new front page of the newspaper anymore, um, there is a lot of attention that is being paid to this. I do think that with the milder variants that we're seeing now, we may actually be seeing a little bit less long COVID. I don't know that to be true, but I think there is some impression of that. We also believe the data supports the idea that vaccinations do protect against long COVID. And so I think for that reason, we may also be seeing less of that. But there is, there is a lot of both clinical work in that area. There are clinics that have been, uh, that have been established and research enterprises that have been built up across the country. We have one of the centers at MGH um, that are really looking into this. So I, I hope that we have more to report, but I don't believe this is an understudied area anymore. It clearly was, but I think we're moving in the right direction. Okay, one, one last question. Yes, um, I think the authenticity and the sincerity of the health information being presented in Massachusetts is so superior to what we're getting on the federal side. And so the question is, when is an after-action report done? Uh, who are the uh, people who participate in the writing of this action, uh, this after-action report? And to what effect? How is it going to be demonstrated as far as credibility to the American I, I, yeah. <laughs> um, I can I can uh, start with the, the sort of hospital and health system perspective. So um, for both Mass General and, and my sister, Mass General Brigham, we're on our third round of after action reports uh, because we've had three waves. Uh, and in each one of them, we bring together essentially all of the leaders across our our command systems and departments. So we've had our nursing leadership, pharmacy leadership psychiatry, obviously intensive care, communications, everyone. We uh, spend a lot of time, um, well, first we start with a survey. We actually get a lot of data from the individuals that we send out to them. We collect that. We reflect it back to the group and, and have a pretty robust discussion about what went well. And frankly, my, I think all of us uh, have the perspective it's more important to document what didn't go so well. In the dogma of what we do uh, in emergency management, every after action report results in an improvement plan, which is a specific list of items to follow up on. Um, we've done that for every one of the hospitals in my system, and then we create a system-wide one as well. As I say, I now have three sets of those for, for, for all the organizations. In, within the healthcare system, we don't make those public, but, but I can promise you that we are following up on them. And um, I think a lot of the reason that we have done better each time is actually that specific process. So I, I mentioned, um, so I'll try to keep this quick, but um, in the first wave, we created multiple different ICUs in my hospital. What we did is we pulled people from all around the hospital, including many of the outpatient clinics and put outpatient nurses paired up with inpatient nurses to try to work. We, we learned that, that people didn't like that specific model of staffing. And specifically out of that after action conference came up with it, with a different way of staffing our ICUs and our surge plan it was much, much better in the second and third wave. So concrete steps, many of them, way too many to mention here, but but have been helpful, but but there's still more. And, and I think one of the challenges is, is trying to weave together our after action process with those of other healthcare systems, with you know, local health departments, with the state, with other states. Um, and, and I think we're gonna be doing that for years. To, to follow up on the improvement plans. So, um, so we sort of feel like we're still in action um, as opposed to after action. Um, but what we have been doing is, um, because we've done ex extraordinary number of public health orders and governor's um, uh, executive orders in a very brief period of time. So we are literally now um, starting to go through 
all the public health orders, all the governor's orders that we put into place, emergency orders, um, some of which have now become law, working with legislators, but literally going through and putting together what we, you would think of as a, um, I don't want to call it a playbook because it needs to be a living document because every search we keep learning. Um, so we're, it's more of an internal exercise right now of taking all the things, all the actions we've taken in two years. And it, as Paul says, it's really not focusing on the ones that worked, but what were the ones that we put in place that did not have the effect or the communication was not as as good as it can be. I'll, I'm gonna give you just one though thing that has completely changed. And it has been an irritant of mine since the very beginning. Everything we first put out was always out in English. And then a, a week later in the States, right? And then several days later, it would be Spanish and then other language. Um, you, as you will see tomorrow, and I'll just give the example. So tomorrow we're putting out what I would call like this, be prepared, right? Um, Spanish and English, 12 other languages two days later. Now that doesn't, that's not an after action, but it's just one of those things that we need to get these information out in the language that is comfortable to people and not say three days later it'll be translated. Um, so those are, so right now that's what we're doing. Because one, we serve, we still think we're in action. Um, and then just starting to go through like now all the internal things. And then we will, we'll be bringing in our healthcare colleagues and the like um, to put together sort of a, a living document, not a huge tome that sort of sits on a, you know, collecting dust. <laughs> I, I don't uh, I don't know if I have anything more to add to that. I think um, you know the the idea as, as you said of an after action report. You know it. We, we talk about the end of the pandemic, and and I don't think it really will go away. It's a con constant process of lessons learned and reassessment, um, and building on what we've done. I think a little bit also we've been doing some deconstructing uh, because we've been we've put so many new systems in place um, and and trying to figure out what we can deconstruct safely. Uh, has been another another challenge. Well, thank you all very much, and thank you so much for your service.